My name is Emra Jackson. I am 37 years old. And prior to having Lyme disease, I was a pharmacist. I worked 40 to anytime 60 hours a week for 10 hour shifts. Um, I lived a very active lifestyle. I used to run as a hobby. Um, sometimes, you know, three miles several times a week. Um, I was a Sunday school teacher. I'm very involved with um, my community and children around me. Um, so I would live a very busy, very busy, very active life. For several years, I had many issues uh, dermatologically with skin rashes, which were unexplained. And one summer, um, I had a rash on my leg, which I thought was weird. Um, and I just kind of ignored it because of all the skin issues I had in the past. I kind of felt like if I go to the doctor one more time for another skin rash, they're going to think, wow, she's really, you know, taking this overboard. So I was like, if, if it um, persists or I have symptoms or something, then I'll go to the doctor. So I was fine. I felt like I was fine. Um, over time, maybe a couple of years, I started developing a lot of sinus issues. So chronic, um, chronic sinus issues. So it wasn't seasonal all year long. I would have um, drainage, uh, sneezing. I would go to the urgent care and get steroids for sinus infections, maybe to the point of two or three times a year where I was getting a steroid injection. And that was really um, considered probably just allergies. Um, then eventually that led to a point where um, I started having more neurological symptoms. I remember a time where and the neurological symptoms weren't really explainable because they would come and go. So I never really felt this need that I was sick or there was something wrong with me that I would never be able to overcome. I um, was out one day with my daughter. We were shopping and I was pushing her in a stroller and we went to order something very simple like a pretzel at um, a cafeteria at the mall. And we were there, and while I was standing there trying to order, and I was looking up at the at the the menu, I could see it, and everything got blurry around it. And for a few moments, um, the cashier was talking to me, and I could not respond back. And I was just standing there, hearing everything going on around me. I was like, "What is going on?" I didn't understand it. Um, I was very fatigued. I sat down and I thought, am I having some sort of a stroke? What, what is going on with me? So I picked up my phone. I was like, I can read. I know I can read. I'm fine. I'll be okay. I don't know. I have no way to explain what happened and it lasted so shortly. So then from that, um, I think the next big sign was I was out walking, trying to do normal things. And me and my dad were going to go to a concert and we had tickets and I was walking. I had worked all day, so I stood on my leg. I was fine there, I had a little bit of pain in my knee. And then I um, was walking and I was very fatigued and I felt like I couldn't control the bottom part of my leg. And then it progressed from there to um, having dizziness. There was one day um, for about three days in a row, I had what would have been considered vertigo. I went to the doctor, they said it's vertigo. If you continue to have this, we're gonna have an MRI. But for me, the whole floor was rolling under my feet and I was trying to live my life um, the best I could. And I thought that the way to do that was to continue working. So I was working and trying to drive a car and all of those things while having that dizziness. Um, and as long as I could stand still, it would be okay, but whenever I was moving, everything under my feet rolled. And that lasted about three days. I got to where I could not sleep well at night. I was having major issues with um, just getting any decent rest, maybe three hours a night. And I didn't tell my family. Um, I kept saying, I'm tired, I'm tired, but I'm gonna be okay. And so no one really understood what I was going through on my day to day trying to um, I guess give the appearance to my family that everything was okay. And I continued until I got mono. Um, once I was diagnosed with mono, 
that was really the last time that I worked. And at that point, I was also going to the emergency room continually because I was having heart palpitations. Um, I felt like my heart at times was going to stop. I had difficulty swallowing, and I kept telling people I'm having difficulty swallowing, I'm having difficulty swallowing. And that led to, oh, you just have anxiety. And so every time I approached a doctor to try to explain things, it was just, you have anxiety. But I knew within myself that something was wrong. And the mono was really kind of the last, was the straw that broke the camel's back for me, so to speak, in uh, basic terms. That was the last thing that really put me basically almost bedridden. I didn't drive after I had mono, and eventually I got to the point where I was in um, a wheelchair. The worst of the worst were two hospitalizations at what I would consider very well-known medical centers, places where people go who have serious conditions and get treatment and are well when they leave and have good answers. Those facilities um, were more of a critical state for me because um, I was having major issues with my heart. I had not slept at some point in several days. Um, I was getting IVs and it was a point where my family members suddenly understood that there was something very serious wrong with me and that I'm, I may not live. And at this point we had asked several people about Lyme disease because it was really the only answer we kind of had left. A lot of stuff had been ruled out. I had so many tests. I have notebooks full of lab tests and um, MRIs and procedures. And so at this point, everyone had thought that I was just going to the doctor just because I was a hypochondriac. And that was not true. It was me really crying out to someone to say, help me, please. I'm sick. And the contrast from my life prior to being that ill for me was very hard because, like I said, I never had anything in my life that I couldn't just work through and overcome. And um, at one of those very well-known medical centers, the um, psychologist told my husband to take your wife home. She's having a midlife crisis. She will be fine. Don't ever take her to another specialist again. So we came home. My family physician recommended cognitive behavioral therapy. It's going to fix everything. And mind you, at this point, I'm in a wheelchair. I am almost bedridden. I have drooling. I have uh, facial paralysis. There are a lot of heart palpitations, dizziness, all of these things that I'm dealing with. And he asked um, me to see cognitive behavioral therapy, which I did. And when I went there, um, the psychologist said, there's something else wrong with you. There's an underlying condition causing all of these symptoms. I think you need to see a cardiologist. Um, my family physician would not refer me to a cardiologist. So I was stuck. I'm a person who has a lot of faith and it was being tested very hard. So, in answer to a prayer, I had no idea what type of Lyme doctor to see. I had no idea what Lyme doctors did. My background as a pharmacist had taught me that Lyme disease was something that could have been treated in 28 days. It wouldn't have made people that sick or as sick as I was. And the um, idea, um, I think, in the medical community is that Lyme disease doctors are people who take people's money, but don't ever make them better. And there couldn't be farther from the truth. And I found that when I came to Gym Sick, that I found a place where the treatment started off. Of course, I was skeptical. I didn't know what I would receive. I didn't know how I would be treated because I had been treated so poorly in the past by the healthcare community. I didn't know that I would be listened to I didn't know that they would take all of my symptoms and listen to what was going on and try to help me find answers. And that's what I was looking for. I wanted answers and I wanted to be well. So 
um, when I came to Jim's Nick, that was an answer to a prayer. Help me find someone who can treat this, can make me better, because no one will help me. So they started me on treatment, and with that, um, to see how much better I could get, the treatment made me very sick. It was very hard to be strong and say, I've got to do this because I have to do this to get better. And that's the mentality I took every time I took the medicine and every time it made me sick, I said, eventually I'm going to get better. Um, I just have to go through this and we'll see what happens. So eventually over the course of the treatment, um, the providers at the clinic helped me to find the other answers and the pieces to the puzzle. So it wasn't just about Lyme disease, it was about other tick-borne illnesses, which I think um, as my experience with the healthcare, um, I would say the other side of the healthcare industry, instead of being someone who provided care, you're receiving care. And to see how I was treated, the idea that it's just Lyme disease and that's the only thing wrong with people. I saw several infectious disease doctors. None of them looked at other bacteria or parasites that are in tick bites, like Dr. Jimsick and the providers here treat. They also, as far as fixing that problem and targeting that aspect of the illness, they also helped me put the other pieces together with what was causing my heart rate um, to be elevated and the palpitations and the dizziness so I was diagnosed with POTS. My family doctor and any other doctor I'd seen prior to this could have done a tilt table test. They could have found that out very easily, uh, but they did not. So uh, Rachel Markey, who is a provider here, said, I think you need to have see a cardiologist. You need to do a tilt table test. With that, I found out I had POTS. POTS is postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. And by finding that out, it was a game changer because it validated all of those symptoms for me that I told people I had all along that they told me was anxiety. The rapid heart rate, the dizziness. Um, so that made me feel better inside because I knew that that was not causing my health issues, that I had a legitimate medical problem. And so that was probably at least three years into my treatment before I even discovered that. The next step that uh, Jim Sick Clinic helped me to um, put together was the difficulty swallowing. The difficulty swallowing, I was told, was caused by anxiety. Um, I remember uh, they suggested doing an endoscopy. So we went um, home and I talked to my family care doctor and he said, well, we'll do a barium swallow first. I'm still not walking very well. So whenever I went to the hospital to have this done, I was in a wheelchair. And um, I'd been to that hospital so many times to have procedures done that when we went in and signed in, I remember um, the people laughing and they said, okay, who wants it this time? Who would like to take care of this patient this time? Um, and that's, that's very hard. Um, I wish that on no one, but I know that Lyme patients experience this all the time, so I'm not the first one and I won't be the last one. After that procedure was done, the um, barium tablet had lodged in my esophagus because it was narrow. And the person who did the procedure walked by and I was sitting in, in the wheelchair there waiting on someone to move me out. And he said, um, you have a very narrow esophagus. He said, like that of a child. The tablet still lodged there and I would recommend not laying down for several hours once you go home. And then when he walked off, I heard him mumble, well, it's no wonder when she was here in the hospital, she was just eating applesauce. And so on the way home from that, I was crying. And my dad had drove me and he said, why are you crying? I said, I've told people for years that I could not swallow and no one believed me. 
So after that, they ordered the endoscopy. I found out I had eosinophilic esophagitis. Dr. Jim Sick um, let me know that that's affiliated with a Bartonella bacteria. They see it in a lot of their patients here. And so that continued on and we got treatment through IVs and other things. And the path continued on. It was a very slow process. I'm on six years of coming to Jim Sick Clinic. And in order to be a Lyme patient, I think you have to be very dedicated, one, to your health, yourself, um, wanting to be well, and doing everything that it takes proactively every day to make yourself better, following what the doctors tell you, and allowing gym sick to um, do what they do best, and that's put together all the pieces that even other doctors have missed for other diagnoses that you may have had all along also contributing. So instead of coming here just to get treatment for an infectious disease, you are getting treatment for your whole body. And that's a very big aspect that I think you don't receive anywhere else. And they do an excellent, excellent job here at that. I am probably the best I've been in six years. I can say that as a testament I do have some days where it's up and down. I regain the ability to drive a car, which I think is pretty impressive. I know all those things sound very um, ordinary to most people, like it's not that big of a deal. And a lot of patients who've been through all of these things understand and appreciate, I think, the small things that other people take for granted every day like driving a car or folding some laundry or walking through your house. And um, that's really where I'm at. The next goal would be to go back to work. And I think honestly for myself, I have always worked <laughs> since I was 16. I worked when I was in college. Um, I just It's just part of who I am. And I'm a very determined person, so part of me will probably not feel like I'm completely well until I can get back and do that. And I'm on my way. I really want to thank Dr. Jim Sick for continuing to fight for Lyme patients. Because without his clinic being here, there are so many people who did, would not have the opportunity to get well. And would continue to be ignored or disregarded. Um, by the regular healthcare system, um, as someone who doesn't have an illness that um, you have an illness that no one believes exists, and Dr. Jensik, by being strong and being a fighter and being determined and continuing to keep open a clinic um, despite the atmosphere and the ideas that have been promoted about what Lyme disease and tick-borne illnesses really are, that he has given patients a great opportunity. He listens, and overall, it's a place where you can receive a whole treatment for your entire body, whereas if you go to a GI doctor, you're only getting a GI treatment and here you're, they see something, they're going to say, here, let's check this out. And I appreciate the clinic so much for everything that they've done, for the compassion that they have, and for the way that they treat people, no matter who they are or where they come from. Lyme disease is something that you will obviously feel like you didn't deserve, and no one does. I don't feel like anyone, even people that I don't like. I would never wish this on anyone. And to say that you're not alone, um, no matter how poorly you have been treated in the healthcare community, you're not alone. You're not the first person with Lyme disease who's been treated that way, and you won't be the last until major changes are made. To keep fighting, to never give up, to take things one day at a time, and to appreciate the small victories that you make along the way in your healing because that's what will keep you going. And the big goals will come later, but fight each day, one day at a time, 
and control the things that you can control, whether it's your diet, exercise, whatever it might be. And if it's just walking from one room to the next, be thankful that you can do that.